now, let's join Ace Broadcaster Mamode Akuga as he takes us inside the Niger Delta. Hello out there and welcome to the program. It's Inside the Niger Delta, the authentic voice of Nigeria's oil-rich region. I'm your regular host, Mamode Akuga. As part of efforts to address the twin challenges of poverty and underdevelopment bedeviling Nigeria's oil-rich Niger Delta region, the federal government in the year 2000 established the Niger Delta Development Commission, NDDC. The establishment of the NDDC was with a clear mandate to initiate and execute projects and programs to improve the lots of the largely impoverished communities and transform the region to become more politically stable and peaceful. In reality, however, the NDDC has failed to live up to the high expectations that greeted its establishment some 19 years ago, and this is the verdict of most Niger Deltans. In their reaction to a prolonged tax feud between the River State Internal Revenue Service and the NDDC, some Niger Deltans recently lashed out at the Commission for allegedly abandoning a statutory mandate on the Niger Delta. Details of the ongoing tax feud are found in our cover story. And finally, this edition of the program is an interview with members of the Isoko Monitoring Group, one of the several emerging groups calling for an end to the political marginalization of the Isoko ethnic nationality. I enjoin you to sit back and relax as we bring you full details of today's package in just a moment. No go away. Niger Delta Development Commission, NDDC, determined to make a difference. Welcome back. And if you are just joining us, it's Inside the Niger Delta, the authentic voice of Nigeria's oil rich region. Activities at the corporate headquarters of the Niger Delta Development Commission, NDDC, in Port Harcourt were brought to a standstill recently following the seal off of its premises by the River State Internal Revenue Service for alleged tax evasion. In the midst of its crisis, the Commission's top management had embarked on two foreign trips on official assignments, leaving most observers worried about the commitment of the NDDC in discharging its mandate to the beleaguered communities of the Niger Delta. Correspondent Chika Obodozie has details. In July last year, officials of the River State Internal Revenue Service, RSIS, we are the corporate headquarters of the NDDC in Potakot with a court order to seal off its premises over alleged tax evasion. The shutdown of operations in the NDDC, according to the State Internal Revenue Service, followed the Commission's failure to remit withholding tax to the River State Government since 2014. We have made frantic efforts to collect these uh, revenues from them. They have not yielded a much desired uh, result. So we resolved to approach the court, and it is the court that gave this order, the party order that brought us here. The order is clear about the amount of money that they are owing us, and that's what we came here to recover. That is accruals, their own self-assessed uh, withholding tax payments, accruals from penalty and interest that gave up about 1.8 uh, billion. For goodness sake. Tax is a creation of law. I want their professionals that have been doing the calculation. So what they calculated is supposed to attract interest and penalty for late payments. In his reaction to the allegation, Chijuki Amunadi, however, faulted the River State government in its action. What is embarrassing about this is that we already had made payments to them. What better goodwill is that? that we met with you and we agreed on what to do and we have begun to do it. So what's the justification for this? Except perhaps to embarrass the NDDC. Nine months after the dramatic tax feud occurred, the River State Internal Revenue Service resumed its debt recovery mission in the month of April this year and sealed off the premises of the NDDC, banding another court injunction to justify its action. According to RSIS, its action was prompted by NDDC's refusal to open up its book for audit. This time, the total indebtedness of the NDDC was put at 50 billion naira, but the commission insists that the figure does not reflect what is available in its records. 
A statement issued by the Commission's Director of Corporate Affairs, Charles Orderly, had expressed surprise at the action of the River State Government despite efforts made in the month of January this year to meet its tax obligation to the state. For eight days, the corporate headquarters of the NDDC was under lock and key, preventing the Commission from carrying out its statutory mandate to coordinate and promote development initiatives in the Niger Delta. That same institution is not responsive to such allegations. Like coming out in the public to say, look, we have paid, these are our papers. Instead, they are gallivanting around the world, you know, where they are, their presence is not like really needed, you know, attending summits, you know, with the same funds that were meant for the development of these regions. It tells the whole story of the embeddedness of corruption, of the institution in the Nigerian corruption, of the whole issue of the Nigerian factor that has taken over that uh, 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 institution. So that institution remains, you know, uh, a mistake of history because when it was being established, we said it that the NDDC that has nine states and is addressing issues of the Niger Delta that does not have nine states is a huge aberration. I'm an indigene of Upenekang, of a Sienu Tiarugin, Upenekang, Ibono local government area. Aquaibom states. There is no road network, there is no light, even the mainland, there is no light. You hardly know that people are living in that environment. But there is no water. The color of water we are using in that place is as yellowish. We call it Nkarafang in my, in my language. That's the kind of water we are taking in that place. We are drinking, but we are Nigeria. We are Niger Delta. The NDDC was established in the year 2000 through an act of parliament to intervene in the crisis of development rocking the Niger Delta region over the years. However, those who are supposed to benefit from the commission's intervention have since scored a low in performance. Where they have the NDC master plan. How is that plan tied to ed education? How is it tied to health of the people? How is it tied to industrialization, technology and the rest? We can't see any connection. We just see people awarding contracts to themselves, becoming rich overnight, and uh, so that they can aff afford the frivolities of life. We are not seeing genuine, you know, development. Genuine development will tie education to the industry. So why is why do we need an industry to be constructing roads where to people's houses? Is that what's going to boost? Uh, 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 production. Despite claims in some quarters that the non-performance of the NDDC is attributable to paucity of funds to effectively operate the system, most critics of the commission think otherwise. In addition to annual budgetary allocations made to the NDDC, it is also funded by other stakeholders in the oil and gas industry. Only last year, Anglo-Dutch oil giant Shell reportedly remitted the sum of 81.5 million US dollars to the NDDC as part of its contribution to the counterpart funding of the commission. NDDC is just an, an institution where the leadership of the minorities from the Niger Delta, you know, where they dump the loot for them to the share. It's not for the general interest of the of Niger Delta. If it was so, Nigeria as a, as a nation is sponsoring a lot of fund into Niger Delta that could have at least developed some part of this. But it is not. The, the projects they bring up are white elephant projects. They are not the projects that will be able to develop the mentality. First of all, you must be mentally developed before you be able to identify what is your right. In spite of receipt of funds from several sources, including statutory allocation, the NDDC has always spent its funds without budgetary appropriation, a practice that not only breeds corruption but promotes misappropriation. Despite having spent its recurrent end capital expenditures for 2018, the NDDC is yet to have an approved budget for the year. Two weeks ago, the Senate Committee on NDDC submitted its report on the 2018 NDDC budget to the Senate. The NDDC is already spending from its 2019 budget estimates with the hope of getting it approved sometime in 2020. Renowned economist Odilim Ewigbara says the EFCC needs to urgently visit the NDDC to get to the bottom of this financial irregularity. You cannot spend, be it capital, be it 
recurrent without appropriation. Because it's the appropriation that actually states the viability of the project, the availability of the fund, and the implementability of the project, and the possible oversight. NDDC shouldn't spend outside appropriation. NDDC must have its budget sent to the National Assembly. And National Assembly will scrutinize it to know if what they are presenting is possible in terms of revenue stream and in terms of uh, expenditure and in terms of the importance of the projects. Anything spent outside the appropriation is criminal and is corruption. The National Assembly wants to call a hearing so that the whole country will know what has transpired. And of course, in the meantime, the EFCC must intervene because it's criminal. The alleged non-performance of the NDDC is blamed on several factors, particularly the veiled political motive behind its establishment in 2000. Most concerned Niger Deltans have underscored, therefore, an urgent need to retool the NDDC and make it more relevant to the needs of the beleaguered Niger Delta communities. They should give an account of all the monies they have spent and they should demand that people who are truly committed to the cause of the region with experience, you know, or a strong background in uh, development should be the ones occupying those places and they should come out with a plan that will be subjected to public scrutiny. Development is not for the sake of development. You don't just build a, I call it development. You building a project is not development in itself. It must be connected and you must target outcomes that you want to achieve with a measurable outcomes. The ensuing tax feud between the River State Internal Revenue Service and the NDDC is as scandalous as it is worrisome, particularly for the ordinary people faced with the persistent challenges of poverty and underdevelopment in the Niger Delta. It is incumbent on the NDDC to open up its books for an audit of its processes over the years. It is also expected that the Commission makes conscious efforts to avert a recurrence of such an avoidable scenario in the collective interest of the Niger Delta region. Inside the Niger Delta. Well, that was the people's verdict on the performance of the NDDC. We hope that urgent steps are taken to rebuild public confidence and trust in the Commission. Inside the Niger Delta and City Associates Potakot River State, in collaboration with Shekinah Institute, Santin Johannesburg, South Africa, presents the 10th edition of its annual International Strategic Management and Leadership Retreat, themed Strategies for Building Personal and Organizational Capabilities for Superior All-Time Performance. Date Friday 7th to Wednesday 12th, June 2019. Venue, Silver Oak Luxury Apartment, 120, Sixth Road, Hyde Park, Santin. Workshop fee, 950,000 Naira to cover workshop participation, resource materials, certificate of participation, accommodation for five nights, breakfast inclusive, guided bus tour of Johannesburg and Soweto, visit the Sun City Resort and visa processing. For inquiries about participation, call Chris on 080-332-80242 or call Princess on 080-205-40134. Explore the world. Call now. And now to politics. Recently, there has been increasing clamor for political space at the state and federal levels by the Isoko ethnic nationality in Delta State, South South Nigeria. Despite having contributed immensely to the economic survival of Delta State and indeed the Nigerian state as a major producer of oil and gas, the Isoko ethnic nationality has been relegated politically without adequate political representation and appointments at all levels of government. This is the scenario the Isoko people want President Muhammad Buhari to address as a matter of urgency. Specifically, they are appealing to Mr. President to appoint one of them into his next cabinet that is expected to be constituted in no distant time. The following interview captures the true feelings of the Isoko people. I have with me in our studios uh, in Port Harcourt today uh, two gentlemen of the Isoko Monitoring Group. Uh, first is Dr. Oke 
Michael Aziabono, who is president of the Isoko Monitoring Group. Welcome to our studios. Thank you, sir. Uh, and also secretary of the Isoko Monitoring Group, Paul Emumena. Michael, welcome to our studios. Thank you so much, sir. I'm going to ask straight up. Uh, we've been doing some reports, uh, and the Isoko agitation has been on now for some time to be part of the Federal Executive Council. You want somebody uh, from your ethnic group to be appointed minister. Why? Okay, uh, if we look at uh, Isoko as an ethnic nationality, we've been producing oil. After Oloibiri, oil was discovered in Isoko in Uzere in 1963. And as of today, we have a total of about 100,000 bars of oil being produced from Isoko nation. And those oil that is being produced is being produced uninterrupted. We've not had issue of violence in Isoko. Isoko is one of the most peaceful ethnic nationality in Nigeria. If you look at the oil that has been produced to sustain the economy of Nigeria since 1963 up to date, you know that Isoko has contributed a lot to the development of this nation. So we look at it that it's, hard, it's time for us to be part. If you look at the return of democracy, since we return to democracy, nine ministers, 1999. since 1999 to date, nine ministers have come out of Delta State, of which if you look at it, the three senatorial districts, each of them have produced three ministers. And the Delta South that we have from Isoko, we have produced three ministers. Out of the three, the judges have produced two, the Shekriti, the Shekriti have produced one a minister, but the Isoko have not produced one. The Shekriti have governors for governor for eight years, but the Isoko, where are, are we? Despite the huge contribution we made to the national coffer. So we believe it is time for the president to appoint somebody from a Isoko ethnic nation to be part of his executive council so that we can also benefit from what other ethnic groups have benefited. Uh, is it enough to say that you deserve to get a minister just because you produce oil. Are there other considerations that you think that, yes, you also deserve to get a ministerial appointment, okay, uh, uh, or is it just because of uh, oil? No, that is not the only reason. Like in my opening remark, I talk about the number of ministers that we've had in Delta State. And if we take a look at the constitution of uh, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, it's talk about equity, fairness, and a uh, uh, federal character. That is why the president cannot appoint ministers from only one particular state. They have to appoint at least a minister from each of the states of the federation. And if you t take it down to Delta State, ministers have been appointed since 1999 up to date. And if you bring it down to Delta South, that where Isoko happened to find themselves, the three mi ministers that have been appointed from the Delta South, none have been appointed from Isoko. So equity and fairness demand that this time around, the president should look inward and look at Isoko. And if I also remember vividly well, when the, the president, the national president of the APC came to Isoko on a solidarity visit to the family, uh, with the family, he told us categorically that it is now time for Isoko to be represented at the federal executive so that our effort, equity, and fairness demand that it is our time. And we have people that are qualified, both old and young, experienced. We have people, so it's not just all about the oil that we produce. So I, I want to also appeal to the government that they should not take our peaceful nation for granted that because Isoko is a peaceful nation that we should not be looked at. It is time. It is now is the time for them to appoint an Isoko man or Isoko woman as a minister. All right, uh, Paul, let me uh, come back to you on this. When, when you talk about marginalization, uh, is it only in political appointments? Don't you have any federal presence in Isoko as we speak today? Uh, uh, you, you, you see, this is one of the issues that give me serious concern. If you come to Isoko, for instance, one of the things you are going to see, the only federal presence you are likely to see in Isoko as a whole, are police stations. Then <laughs> maybe, may, may, then, 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 then may, you know, increasingly more about post offices of no value. And there may be with some nepal poles or, or, or cable wires that are not even supplying electricity to the Isoko people. If you come to Isoko ethnic nationality, there is no single federal presence. We don't have federal institutions. There is not, we don't have any, even the IOC operating in our land, they are just exploiting and extorting our people. If you come there, there is nothing. And, and we, 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 we come to believe that this is largely also because the Isoko people are not being considered into federal appointment position where they can make input, where they can be part of the decision makers of this country. We have contributed a lot for this country. So we believe 
that it is necessary for his so man to also be part of the decision makers we want to serve it should not just be as though the so man we just uh, the, the uh, all years have been taken from our land and then we are exposed to several health hazards our people are are, are, being, are, being, are, being, are being maltreated and at the end of the day there is no federal government present no 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 good roads no uh, 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 good healthcare systems no federal institutions in isoko land if we continue like this it will come to a time that the isoko man may likely revolt we're not praying for that the isoko people are very very peaceful people our peaceful nation has been used against us they are taking advantage of the peaceful nation of the isoko people we cannot receive uh, 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 the, the needed uh, 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 basic amenities we need from the federal government or the state government because we are peaceful this is wrong criminality should not be rewarded against peaceful people we are peaceful we are law-abiding people of nigeria we have the qualified workmen that we need nigeria should come and also patronize the Isoko people so that we can also have good roads to walk we can also have good waters to drink so that we can also have electricity in data state the electricity in Isoko is one of the worst in the entire data state, they don't have electricity. But if you come to Isoko, you will cry for us. It is total darkness. And these are some of the reasons we have seen. And we say, no. Why are these things continuing? If we have somebody in the Federal Executive Council, for instance, the cry of the Isoko people will be listened to. The Isoko man will be represented fairly and equitably. These are the things we are trying to condemn. And we are, we, it has come to a time where the Federal Government, we, we, President Buhari will know him to be a man that that loves equity he fights for fairness we know him to be as such he is not going to join successive government to undermine the soko people we know he's not going to join successive government to maltreat and marginalize the soko people so we are calling on him it is a change administration he should come and deal equitably with the soko people he should deal justice to the soko people we want to see him change this ugly narrative we cannot continue like this we're not going to take it any longer honestly Okay. Something should be done to assuage. Something should be done to change this ugly narrative. Our people are dying, and we are not going to take it any longer. All right. Uh, let me give you the last word, uh, President. Um, there have been talks about the amnesty program, which the federal government, of course, put in place to, uh, you know, uh, try to rehabilitate those that uh, were involved in the struggle in the Niger Delta, uh, especially those who were involved in the armed struggle. Now, but the stages are different. Um, apart from you know rehabilitating those that were involved in the armed struggle, the program is supposed to get to a point where it's supposed to engage youths in the Niger Delta. And there are talks that the Isoko youths have not uh, been involved at all in this program. Is that true? Yeah, it's very correct. The Isoko youth have not been involved. Like uh, what my secretary talked about, the amnesty program it was a good program, but what we've seen with the Isoko who are peaceful, we have seen that. The federal government is rewarding criminality rather than people that are peaceful. So we are calling on the federal government to look at the program and engage Isoko youths so that we don't want to go into violence because other ethnic groups have gone into violence and they are being rewarded. But we've appealed to our people to stay calm and we are calling on government to look at the program. Even people in Delta North who are producing less than us, they are being rewarded. They, are, they have an amnesty program that they are being rewarded. Why is it that it's the turn of the Isoko that we cannot get such thing? So we are calling on government that it should put a program in place to make sure that the Isoko youth are involved. They are trained. We have people that are ready to train and ready to contribute their quota to the development of this nation. So we are calling on the federal government to do whatever they can, whatever program, they, whatever name they want to call the program. We don't mind. What we are interested in, our people are trained so that the health hazard that they face, they will see that they are being rewarded for what they are facing, for what they are, they, the nation have given to them, for what they have contributed to this country called Nigeria. Like my secretary said, if not for Isoko oil that was flowing in 2016, today, that, at that point in time, the state government, they were bleeding, they were crying. But with Isoko, we kept our oil flowing and the state was still kept afloat. So we want to be, we want our youth, our women to be rewarded. Not this peanut that they are giving to them as a, a, from the party, no. We want a system that will train them. We know what is being done in the amnesty program. People are sent outside of this country, stay three years, four years, they come back as trained engineers. Why is it is it that it's, it's the turn of his so-called that we are not having such thing? So we are calling on the federal government and all well-meaning Nigerians to join force with us.
to plead with President Buhari, a man that we believe that can do justice to our cause, that he should put a program in place so that we, the so-called youth, the so-called youth women, can also benefit. All right, thank you very much. Um, we've been talking about the Isoko ethnic nationality. They say that they have been very faithful to Nigeria. They say they have not been involved in any violence whatsoever. And they say as a result of that, they do not see the dividends. They have not been rewarded for their very rather peaceful nature and ensuring that uh, people live in peace and harmony. They say they should get their reward now so that their youths do not believe and get used to the fact that peaceful nature does not bring any development whatsoever. Uh, let me thank uh, Dr. Oke, Michael Aziabonu, President of the Isoku Monitoring Group, uh, and Paul Emumena, Michael, Secretary of the Isoku Monitoring Group. Thank you, thank you so much, thank gentlemen, you. for being in our studios. Thank you so much. Inside the Niger Delta continues after this time out. Don't go away. Inside the Niger Delta. Overcome that blackout. Enjoy 24 hours affordable electricity without noise pollution or daily purchase of petrol or diesel. Invest in alternative power from Exalted Eagles Nigeria Limited. We stock high-grade, long-lasting solar panels, modern hybrid inverters, and rugged long-life batteries. We also have for sale solar-powered water heaters and water pumping machines. We also stock for sale large quantities of solar-powered street lights, security lights, and lanterns, as well as powerful voltage regulators and auto gate openers. We guarantee our products with reliable after-sales service at our maintenance centers. We have offices all over the Niger Delta, including Lagos and Abuja. For contacts, call Kinsley on 0806-388-7516 or Nick on 090-87-000-335. Exalted Eagles Nigeria Limited, your source for alternative power. That's the size of our package on the program. Inside the Niger Delta, the authentic voice of Nigeria's oil-rich region will be back on this station same time next week. You can get more details of this program and indeed catch up on our past episodes by following us on our social media handles showing on your screen right now. On behalf of the production crew, I'm yours sincerely, Mamode Akuga, thanking you for staying tuned. Bye for now.